One of the first geography questions I ever had was about deserts. I live in North Carolina, and I wondered why there's no desert here or anywhere nearby, not in South Carolina, Georgia, or Florida. Because around the world, it's pretty common to find deserts at the same latitude as the Southeast United States. And when you take an earth science class in high school, you'll probably learn that deserts are usually found around 30 degrees north and south in the subtropics. The explanation is pretty simple. It's the Hadley cell. Air tends to rise most intensely at the equator, where more heat is available. As the air rises, it produces heavy rain at the equator. But what goes up must come down somewhere, so this sinking air falls onto the adjacent subtropics. Sinking air produces dry weather. As a result, we should tend to see deserts in the subtropics. Some textbooks will tell you that you should find a consistent band of deserts at these latitudes, with only rare exception. But on our actual planet, that's not what we see. More often than not, subtropical deserts are absent from major eastern coastlines. At subtropical latitudes, the eastern coastlines are usually much more humid than the west. This is true in the United States, where the desert southwest sits at the same latitude as the infamously humid southeast. It's true in South America, where the subtropical Atlantic coast is much more humid than the Pacific, it's true in South Africa, it's true in East Asia, and even in famously dry Australia, there is no subtropical desert on the East Coast. There is a large temperate desert in Argentina, in the far south, which is not at a subtropical latitude. I'll mention this later. And there are mostly tropical deserts on the western side of the Indian Ocean, but this area deserves its own future video, so I'll leave that alone for now. Overall, these humid eastern coastlines aren't the exception. They're the general rule. Some people will tell you this is all just due to warm currents on the east coast, but that's actually a very small piece of the puzzle. So what is the primary explanation? Well, it mostly comes back to that Hadley cell I mentioned earlier. The Hadley cell is a heat-driven process, which means the distribution of continents and oceans is going to affect it. Oceans and continents have very different thermal properties. So, let's say it's summer. The air over the continents is hot and rising rapidly, creating low pressure, while the ocean is much cooler by comparison. That means the easiest place for air to sink is over the ocean. And that leads to the development of gigantic, high-pressure systems over the ocean. The air that sinks here rushes outward, and due to the Coriolis force, it takes a curved path. In the Northern Hemisphere, high-pressure systems spin clockwise, while in the Southern Hemisphere, they spin counterclockwise. As you can see, these high-pressure systems move humid, tropical air poleward along the western sides of the ocean, the eastern sides of the continent. They also move warm, tropical water in the same direction. On the opposite side of the ocean, these winds create cold currents and upwelling. So the atmospheric subsidence, that sinking air, is reinforced over this side of the ocean, because it's cooler. And you can clearly see that on this animation. The whole system moves north when the northern hemisphere has its summer, and it moves south when the southern hemisphere has its summer. During the winter, each high-pressure system dips toward the tropics and stretches out, acting a lot more like the introductory textbook says it should. So during the summer, eastern coastlines get a consistent supply of humid air from the tropics and from the ocean to their east. And having a warm current nearby really helps, because warmer water means more humidity. That summer rainfall is really important because that's when plants need water the most. And the summer rainfall is what reaches inland the farthest, watering fertile grasslands toward the interior of each continent. Now, this whole moisture delivery system is a lot more effective in certain areas, like East Asia and Eastern North America. Here, winds come straight off of the Gulf of Mexico and the South China Sea. 
But in South America, the Amazon rainforest does help quite a lot, acting a bit like a sea of its own. The trade winds bring North Atlantic moisture into the Amazon, and this moisture is recycled back up into the atmosphere. Transpiration from the plants and evaporation from the wet soil humidifies the air. This humid air flows into the subtropics, fueling rainfall there. You'll detect this humid flow over about a thousand meters in altitude, and it's a really important source of rainfall for places like northern Argentina. Summer rainfall is really where the subtropical east coast stands apart from the west coast at the same latitude. However, winter precipitation is still important. It recharges shallow groundwater, ensuring that plenty of water will be available in spring. In winter, when cold air masses grow, the westerly winds of the temperate latitudes dip into the subtropics. And you might think this would lead to dry conditions because the air is coming from the dry interior, not off of the ocean. And it often does. But embedded within those westerly winds are low pressure systems. As they pass by, they'll pull in air from every direction, including nearby oceans. At the same time, they'll create warm fronts and cold fronts, which force the humid air upward until it produces rain or snow. Again, having something like a Gulf of Mexico really helps here, and it's actually why some of the Gulf states in the U.S. see a rainfall maximum in winter. Now, although I have grouped all of these humid eastern regions together, you can clearly see there are major differences between them. In particular, Argentina is much drier at temperate latitudes than any of these other examples. You might point out that the Patagonian steppe is in a rain shadow. It barely gets any moisture from the Pacific, thanks to the Andes Mountains. But then again, New England certainly doesn't either. There are multiple mountain ranges preventing Pacific moisture from reaching the East Coast. Instead, New England is watered mostly by evaporation from the Atlantic. So why doesn't temperate Argentina see something similar? The main reason for this disparity may be the orientation of the coastline and the shape of the continent. East Asia and Eastern North America lean into the great high pressure systems of the ocean, so they receive the humid airflow more consistently. South America's southern cone, on the other hand, does exactly the opposite. And in addition, you can see how the Andes Mountains make it less likely for humid air to reach the far south. They help channel humid air away from it. This also creates a major difference in winter storm tracks. You see, in winter, the temperature contrast between cold interior air and warm air over the ocean creates cyclones. In the U.S., we call the severe ones nor'easters. Due to the Coriolis force, these cyclones move toward the poles and curve eastward. So in North America, nor'easters follow the shoreline and produce heavy snow or rain in the mid-Atlantic and northeast. These cyclones are responsible for most of the winter precipitation in the region. And although some of them may produce devastating blizzards and ice storms, they also recharge shallow groundwater for plants to use in spring. Similar winter cyclones do form off of Uruguay and Argentina, but because of the orientation of the coastline, they move offshore, leaving the southern coast dry. Across our planet, the climate differences we see between east and west are just as important as the differences we see north to south. As always, the sources for this video are in the description. For more geography, science, and history topics, check out the Casual Earth blog on casualearthwithdandavis.wordpress.com. Thanks for watching. If you find these topics interesting, consider subscribing. There will be many more to come.